More than 100 years after a four-year-old Bobby Dunbar disappeared, the case is still technically unsolved. And what a case it is. Two mothers, each convinced one boy was their own son, a town convinced a miracle had happened when the lost boy was found eight months later, a man wrongly sent to prison for a crime he didn't commit, and DNA tests almost a hundred years later showing one man was not who he thought he was. It was national news for two years and is still talked about to this day in Opelousas, Louisiana. It seemed like an open and shut case and many folks decided they knew what had happened right off the bat. But the truth is, no one knows what happened to this day to little Bobby Dunbar. Let's dig into this. Robert Clarence Dunbar was born on May 23, 1908, the first child of Clarence, who was called Percy, and Lessie Dunbar of Opelousas, Louisiana. His brother Alonzo was born two years later. Percy was a successful partner in an insurance agency in town and had both money and influence. In late August of that year, he, Lessie, four-year-old Bobby, and two-year-old Alonzo went on vacation with other family and friends to Swayze Lake, a little less than 20 miles from their home. There are several lakes in the area, and some had been used as campsites for workers on the Opelousas Gulf and Northeastern Railroad, known locally as the OG. Swayze Lake was a popular vacation spot with cabins and great fishing and swimming areas. Percy had some business to attend to and was reportedly away the morning of August 23rd but reportedly returned for a fishing outing with a few of the other men from their group. And from this point on, things get complicated and reports of what happened vary wildly. Most reports say the family returned to their cabin for lunch and discovered Bobby was not with them. But some who were there gave a different story. They claimed Bobby had gone off that morning to find his father and had been told to go back to the cabins by the men who were fishing. Either way, Bobby Dunbar disappeared and the group immediately started searching for him. Bobby was nowhere to be found. Later searches found footprints leading away from the area towards a railroad trestle and the hat Bobby had been wearing, but no trace of the little boy. They searched for days. Some reports say alligators in the area were slit open to see if any contained the bones of a child and the lake was dynamited to see what rose to the surface from the muddy depths. Despite the exhaustive searches, no other trace of Bobby was found. There had been reports of a strange man in the area, and the thought that little Bobby had been kidnapped led Percy to offer a reward for information. It became a nationwide search and made all the newspapers. Eight months after their son disappeared, the Dunbars were informed a child in Mississippi looked just like his photo in the papers, and he was traveling with a repairman, which was suspicious. The man was William Cantwell Walters, and he was from North Carolina. He was working at odd jobs in Mississippi and did have a young boy with him. He claimed the boy was Bruce Anderson, the son of a woman named Julia Anderson who had worked for his family. Julia had married and divorced after having Bobby, and her last name was actually Floyd, but all the papers called her Julia Anderson. Walters said that he took the boy because Julia did not have the means to take care for him. Despite his explanations, or maybe because of it, Walters was detained while the Dunbars traveled by train to see if this child was their son. Here again, reports of what happened vary. Newspaper said the boy called Lessie Dunbar mama and she promptly fainted. But the truth is, Lessie wasn't sure at first this was her son. It would take an examination of moles and scars on his body before she was more certain. Newspapers reported that the family hoped that by returning to their home, they could encourage Bobby's memories and be even more sure. But first they took Bobby to New Orleans 
where John M. Parker, the future governor of Louisiana, completed a short investigation and stated publicly the boy was indeed little Bobby Dunbar. And after that, the Dunbars went home to a cheering crowd, waiting to celebrate the miracle of a happy ending to the story. Julia Anderson Floyd did not have money or connections. A newspaper paid her way from North Carolina to Opelousas to identify her son and corroborate William Walter's story. By this time, Walters had been arrested for kidnapping Bobby Dunbar and sent to Opelousas for trial. Julia said she had given permission for Walters to take her son to visit his sister for a few days and hadn't seen them since. When Julia finally saw the boy, she had doubts, just as Lessie Dunbar had. And just like Lessie, after a little time and closer examination, she felt it was her son. The town of Opelousas did not act kindly to poor Julie Anderson, and newspapers had a field day insinuating any mother would surely know their own child. Her morals and lifestyle were vilified by the time she was needed to testify at Walter's trial, she was so ill from being upset, she had to give a statement from her sickbed. She insisted the child was her son, Bruce, and Walters was innocent of any crime. It did Walters no good. He was convicted late in 1914 and sentenced to life in prison. His attorney appealed to the Louisiana Supreme Court on a technicality, and the conviction was overturned. The district attorney declined to try Walters again, and he was set free. The little boy remained with the Dunbar family and always believed he was Bobby Dunbar. He married and had four children and a career in Opelousas. He died in 1966 in Houston, Texas. His parents' marriage fell apart in the late 1920s, and they divorced. Lessie would remarry and live a rather sad life, by all accounts, dying in Opelousas in 1971. Percy lived the rest of his life in town, working at the insurance business, and participating in local politics, dying in 1931. Julia Anderson Floyd would marry the brother of her attorney and have seven more children. She lived in Mississippi and insisted until the day she died in 1940 that Bobby Dunbar was really her son, Bruce Anderson. Her children knew the story, and they told their children. And every so often, newspapers and television shows and the occasional book would tell the story of a disappearance and miraculous reappearance of little Bobby Dunbar. His granddaughter, Margaret Dunbar Cutright, was fascinated by the story and determined to find the truth. She would eventually persuade her father, Bobby Dunbar Jr., to agree to a DNA testing. And a son of Bobby Dunbar's brother, Alonzo, agreed to give a sample for comparison. The test shows, without a doubt, that Bobby and Alonzo Dunbar were not related. So the story that started with the disappearance of a four-year-old boy ends the same way. If the man who lived and died believing he was Bobby wasn't, what really did happen? There have been rumors over the years, of course. One was that Bobby had fallen and hit his head and died and was buried somewhere in the deep woods near Swayze Lake. Another said that the child drowned or that an alligator killed him. And yet another said he was taken away from his own family and raised somewhere else by some other family. It may be much of the same story as the man who lived his life as Bobby Dunbar who most likely was really little Bruce Anderson. A huge thank you to Carola Lily Hartley for her gracious access to her personal photo collection and her generosity with her research and knowledge of this story. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think happened in the comments. Hey, here's another Dragon Den video you might like. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button. And you can hit the notification bell if you'd like to know when our videos come out. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.